Our commitment to internet freedom is a commitment to the rights of people, and we are matching that with our actions. Monitoring and responding to threats to internet freedom has become part of the daily work of our diplomats and development experts. Internet freedom, what does that even mean? It's a rallying cry for activists, a policy approach for lawmakers, and a question to debate for journalists. Progressive media activists want an internet that is free of censorship and that corporations can't dominate. Politicians say they want it both ways, an internet that is good for democratic dialogue and good for business. How can the same term be used by these two groups that don't agree on much of anything? Internet freedom has been in the news a lot in the last few years. The term has been associated with activists who led the internet blackout to stop SOPA. It is used in association with whistleblowing and WikiLeaks, the Chinese firewall, Arab dictators who shut down the internet, and the imprisonment of hackers. Internet freedom is tied to debates on open source publishing, network neutrality, mashup culture, conglomerated media corporations, file sharing, BitTorrents, intellectual property rights, and the Pirate Bay. According to information activists, the right to internet freedom is violated when Facebook suddenly changes its privacy settings, for instance, and when Silicon Valley collaborates with the US NSA in acts of surveillance. What is internet freedom? What is the internet? What is freedom? Is there a single global internet? Can there be a single principle for all of the internet in every country? Are we talking about libertarian, laissez-faire, free market types of freedom to buy and sell in a marketplace, or progressive freedom of speech and freedom of association in a democracy? To answer these questions, we travel to London to ask leading scholars in media studies just one question. What is internet freedom? If I was to say what internet freedom is, I'd say we don't have it now and that we would need to protect an entirely public space which is free of any corporate interest guiding it. Something which is entirely a bit like public service broadcasting in its best form, which was owned by the public for the public. So we're not tied in to the algorithmic structures of the big corporate organisations which have basically taken over that space. I want me personally to be free and I want the internet to be free of corrupting and distorting influences. Working with a number of people who have a completely different understanding of internet freedom and it depends context specific, it is geographically specific. And it means not being against the idea of it, but just saying, whose freedom are we talking about? What kind of ways of addressing a lack of freedom? Who is responsible for the lack of freedom? And all too often you find that it is a combination of states and market forces working together, of private groups and the biggest governments who are working together. Whatever language they use, they may be saying, we're the biggest internet freedom advocates. You have to pin them down and say, right, what is in place? And I think all too often, the term has been abused. So it's not that we should avoid the term, necessarily, you just need to clarify what it's about. Internet freedom is a good question. It's like the uh, freedom to, hmm, to be able to communicate as freely as possible without any restrictions um, on the internet, digitally, to your peers and to other people. The internet gives us new ways to communicate that suggest we can achieve better forms of freedom. But it's also an interesting object for thinking with about what freedom means. Freedom on Facebook, I, you know, it may or may not be the case that being more free on Facebook is really a crucial goal right now in getting to a more free society. But the fact that People think about it. They get annoyed when an ad pops up or when they miss certain kinds of statements by friends because of the, the Facebook sorting algorithm. And so it's, the, 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 there's something about digital technology which is so present in our lives and just kind of lying around us now and a part of everyday experience that the little struggles there can serve as interesting objects for thinking about freedom more broadly. 
internet freedom in India uh, sometimes could also mean to to say things which may not be able to be said in the press and on TV. So that's one idea of internet freedom. I really like thinking about freedom from the perspective of Isaiah Berlin. So there's two kinds of freedom. There's negative freedom and there's positive freedom. And positive freedom is the freedom to, and negative freedom is the freedom from. So let's say we have the freedom to, I have the freedom to express my opinion or I have the freedom from having my opinion squashed by somebody else. So when we're thinking about internet freedom, we tend to think about it being the freedom to, but increasingly our internet freedom is being redefined as the freedom from. Freedom from federal government, and that is where most of the money and lobbying energy is currently being uh, focused. That's putting it very simplistically, but effectively that's what it's about, and that whole internet freedom um, narrative has been pretty much dominated by pro-US service providers. Inevitably, service providers want freedom from federal interference. Internet freedom is about fighting for those rights necessary to ensure a more democratic and diverse use of media, a world where more people have access to the means of cultural production and circulation. So that may mean net neutrality, it may mean shifting copyright law, it may mean a number of things that fight back against regulatory structures which would silence collective voice in an internet era. Internet freedom in, in, in Nigeria, in my own opinion, uh, implies access to the medium of, to the, medium of the internet, um, freedom to undertake transactions on the internet, uh, freedom to upload information onto the medium. I think that internet freedom from an activist perspective is very much connected to the notion of autonomy. How autonomous are we in our communications? How can we move away from this culture of surveillance? Um, how can we challenge the increased commercialization of the internet? The internet is just the everything into which we're expanding, which is now supplementing every action, every space every moment of time. Um, whereas freedom is normally about specific actions, or at least specific infrastructures for action, which are grounded in various ways, That's, they need to be free. But um, I'm not sure it gets us very far to talk about the internet free. We need to talk about whether particular types of action are free, able to be practiced without interference online, or if practiced apparently freely, are they then subject to forms of surveillance, which immediately raise the costs and risks of those actions so much that they're no longer, they might only apparently be free and they will suit over time be subject to a friction which means they'll stop happening at all. Complacency, inevitability, a refusal to actually engage in struggle to get there. And I mean that either on a kind of technological inevitability in which some people think if we just let the internet be, we'll get freedom. And on the other side, a kind of economic inevitability, a critical perspective which often assumes we'll never get there, why bother? Threat by internet freedom to those who don't have access would mean that their issues would get sidelined there. And I think it's interesting because the internet is both the tool to advocate this and also the object of, of advocacy. You can see threats to internet freedom, both from the state, but also and increasingly by private intermediaries. Uh, a number of uh, obvious regulatory harms have arisen um, as the internet has embedded itself in our everyday lives. Uh, you can see there is, in a sense, a need for some form of regulation. And the way states are responding is, in some senses, by harnessing the ability of intermediaries to regulate activity on the internet, where they themselves fail because of the jurisdiction problem. most definitely the way that big corporations have taken over the online space, used it simply to collect data on the individuals and follow and track whatever they're doing in order to sell that on 
to other people, but also to organise the information that is online itself. So we think when we do a Google search, or many people think, that what they get fed back is what everybody else would get fed back if they were doing it. It's not. Actually, you put in, it, tra it, it looks very carefully at what you've tracked in previously, and it gives you back stuff you think you'll, they think you'll find interesting. If you just want to make the internet free for the Googles and the Microsofts and that's the end of it, then that's not really being free. The internet was supposed to deliver individual empowerment. It was supposed to actually allow different voices to be expressed in these new wonderful platforms. And at the moment, it's going in the opposite direction. So if it's going to be free, we have to deal with that issue. The biggest threat in Egypt is the government. Uh, it's a government that is, uh, I think, so fragile and so scared uh, that they are going every single, uh, they're going after every single uh, uh, note on Twitter and every single, uh, you know, uh, status on Facebook and every single blog post. Uh, and uh, to me, that just give, gives me an impression of, of how weak and how fragile the government is. It's, it's about to fall apart and it's, uh, it's scared. The biggest threat to internet freedom in Nigeria uh, if you ask me, is the recent very sad development in the United States, you know, of um, the United States government, you know, uh, going behind doors to have access to all the citizens, all citizens' communications on all those, on all such platforms as Google, Microsoft, and so on and so forth. The NSA is the National Security Agency. It's um, the, a U.S. agency that uh, has historically been into signals intelligence, I mean, Cold War stuff, of trying to intercept signals around the world to figure out what the enemy is doing. And now they're building a huge data center um, in Utah where they can store all of the stuff for long periods of time. They're also doing two other things that have been come out in the news recently. The PRISM program is uh, their access to the uh, internet uh, service providers like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Apple where they can access their databases directly uh, to get information on subscriber. And the third thing that's come out just recently is um, a, uh, I guess it's a, a FISA court judgment, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, that um, uh, requires telecom companies, notably Verizon in this case, but I'm sure it applies to others, to get um, the metadata, the, the data about communications, um, who call, uh, what number called, what other number, when and for how long, to collect that on a, on a comprehensive basis. Computers. Twenty years ago, there wasn't even a name for them. Say there are many threats. Uh, I think uh, the recent scandal ar around, or the revelation, shall we say, around the NSA, the way in which it has got its hooks in multiple ways into the very fabric of the internet, is a fundamental threat. I think also and connected to it is the way in which the large corporations that uh, operate key aspects of it are, are getting larger and larger and less and less accountable. Uh, and that's another major threat. People are fighting for, for freedoms online and offline. Uh, and it, it's part of the ongoing struggle and it's uh, helped us a great deal. It's helped us um, come a long way in terms of how we organize things, how we run discussions, uh, how you, I mean, every single demonstration is basically all organized online. And then you tell people about it, you use word of mouth to tell others, you use television maybe to spread the news if it's something major, uh, but it starts online, everything starts online. It's possible to be naive about internet freedom. I don't think there are purely technical solutions to political problems. I think political problems are political problems and need to be solved through politics. But uh, I do think that there's a lot of clues and interesting things to think about in association with what people talk about when they talk about internet freedom that help us, that can get us down the road mm. a little bit further. My internet freedom may not be the same as someone else's, but I'm not ready to junk it, I'm ready to actually fight for it. 
citizens of the world, we are anonymous. You'll chose on October the 20th to make up Big Brother voice around worldwide to inform people about the threatens of surveillance systems on their freedom. We are now in times when stakes about both individual and common liberties are critical. Smack in the middle of an economic and social crisis, we have adjourned our attention about those matters. We forgot such atmospheres often lead to threatens on our fundamental rights. We call you once again to act against systems of the almighty surveillance state. You noticed how many efforts governments deploy to mark and spy people worldwide. They plan to use technology to know everything about citizens including who is who, who do what, and with whom, as well in real life and the internet. Internet freedom is being interfered with in major ways and it shouldn't. I think the internet should have been considered from day one a country of its own that isn't bound by any individual country's laws. Maybe we could have had an internet government, but it didn't happen just like world government doesn't happen. You know, space doesn't belong to anyone. The moon doesn't belong to anyone. These are really beautiful principles in life. And then as soon as a country figures out a way to get control of them, it disappears. I'm an optimist and I believe we can move more and more towards net neutrality.